going to call this conference committee the Jobs and the, uh, the Jobs and Energy Conference Committee uh, to order. Uh, I will start on time. I expect the Senate will do the same. They are um, just as competent as we are. Now, I just want you all to be aghast that I actually complimented the Senate because that's not my normal behavior patterns. Um, you know, members, welcome to the conference committee. Uh, Senator Pratt and I will be uh, switching off on a daily basis. Uh, who is running this, um, running the conference committee? Um, our time is very compact. I, um, in, in, in today's world, I don't get a handwritten letter sent to me, but my understanding is that we are supposed to be done with our bill on the 13th, by the 13th to allow time to have it written up and sent to the floor of both chambers. Uh, and so that we're not running around crazy try at the last minute. Uh, so I think we have about nine days, something like that. Um, uh, today we'll hear from uh, three of the highest prior priorities of the Jobs Committee, the paid family leave, the earned sick and safe time, and the wage theft. Um, we're not going to take, a, well, we'll do a little bit of that. And then just for housekeeping uh, and for the senators, uh, when they, uh, if someone would pass along, uh, everyone has the, um, the, the 2208 and the Senate, what's the Senate number? I don't know. Everyone has a copy of 2208 with them or in their files. If you want it, um, if you want it in your black folder, please leave a note. Typically, these folders get pretty f filled up with everything else that we get from uh, spreadsheets to <laughs> handouts that the advocates will bring forth. Um, so, with that. Uh, why don't we uh, introduce ourselves? Uh, I am Representative Mahoney, the Chair of the Jobs Committee. Uh, Travis Rees, Committee Administrator for the House Jobs Committee. Gene Wiginius, Chair of Energy and Climate. Jamie Long, Vice Chair of Energy and Climate. Uh, Zach Stevenson, I sit on Jobs, uh, Commerce, and Energy. Odin Hassan, I sit in jobs. Michael Molnar, committee administrator and committee legislative assistant. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair, members, my name is Mike Molson. I'm the CA for Energy and Climate. Uh, Mr. Chair, David Sullivan with House DFL Research. Mr. Chair, Zach Zimmerman, committee legislative assistant for Energy and Climate Committee. Chelsea Whitman, House GOP Research. Solveig Beckel, House Fiscal Analysis, Nonpartisan Staff. Anna Shaleen, House Research Analyst. Ben Weeks, House Research. Andy Eilers, Committee Administrator for Jobs and Economic Growth in the Senate. Carlin Doyle Fontaine, Senate Counsel for the Jobs Committee and Energy Committee. Casey Mum, uh, Senate Fiscal Analyst. Pat Kaluza, Committee Legislative Assistant for Senator Pratt. Craig Janicich, Senate DFL Research. And as uh, we're going to wait here for a second for my counterpart, um, it, it's a hard walk for them to get over here. I thought it was one o'clock Senate time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Eric Pratt, uh, uh, Chair of the Senate Jobs and Economic Growth Committee. Um, and first off, uh, I think, is Lori Helverson here? Oh, there we are. Uh, I'm going to call you to the uh, testifier table. Give us a little um, um, conversation about paid family leave. And, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, certainly. point of order, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, traditionally, the, the chairs of the 
committee come together and work out the rules and the agenda ahead of time um, that we set the meeting times, we set the place, um, and uh, quite honestly, Mr. Chair, uh, this meeting was called before Senate conferees were appointed. Um, we have conferees from outstate Minnesota that had uh, commitments and couldn't be here. Uh, we don't have a, a, a quorum on the Senate side, so I would, I would want to make sure that uh, no business is being conducted. This is uh, simply an informational hearing, but uh, uh, Mr. Chair, typically the first hearing is, is used for a walkthrough of the side-by-sides. I'd ask uh, Council if uh, we have side-by-sides ready yet. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, no, there are, we have reviewed as uh, nonpartisan staff some drafts, but uh, nothing has been finalized or posted on the side-by-side -side, uh, official website for the revisers. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I might ask, um, what is the purpose of the, of the conference committee? Why are, why, why are we getting this gist together? Uh, if I might clarify, are you meaning why are we hearing these uh, bills today or the conference committee as a whole? The conference committee as a whole. Uh, Senator Pratt and members of the committee and audience, uh, as I said earlier, we have nine days to uh, uh, get our bill done, to come to agreement on that which in this bill we can all agree on, and then decide how we're going to handle that which we can't agree on. Um, because the time is short, uh, I believe there's been an <coughs> agreement amongst leadership that these bills have to be back to the respective bodies by the 13th. Um, uh, I hope that's not dependent on our leadership coming up with a joint target. Uh, so I thought we, I believe that we need to get going. I think it's important that we start moving forward on this. These are important issues for these particular bills uh, that we'll hear today are important. Uh, your <coughs> chamber has heard one of them or a version of one of them has not heard the other two and those are uh, those two paid family leave and earned sick and safe time are important uh, important to the house and the house members they pass with uh, um, with a margin with enough of a margin to be in play thank you uh, thank you for that mr. chair uh, but but mr. chair wouldn't you say that uh, this being a budget year, the most important thing we have to do is pass a budget that will fund the agencies? I think all, all bills that are passed by either chamber, whether it's the House or the Senate, are important pieces. Um, the budget certainly is very important, but how we treat workers in this state is also important. Well, uh, thank you for that, Mr. Chair, and I, and I can appreciate that. Um, you know, certainly in the Senate, we, we view the, the role of the Jobs Committee uh, to be one where we allow every Minnesotan to participate uh, in the economy. But uh, we spent a lot of time focusing on the budget, and I know we had significantly different targets. Um, we don't have side-by-sides or bill comparisons ready to go yet. Uh, it seems to me that uh, our staff's time would be better used getting that work done so that we could jump into the review of the two bills, identify those items that are the same, those items that are similar, and those items that we need to work on. And, and rather than uh, taking up two hours of their time uh, in a hearing that's just basically going to be informational because we don't have, uh, because you set this meeting before our Senate conferees were assigned, um, that, and I'll talk about this in a minute, I believe that you broke uh, the joint rules and uh, Masons in establishing this meeting and that uh, uh, we really need to get on a, and, and, and the deadline that we really have is not a policy deadline, it's a budget deadline. And your point is that I broke a rule trying to speed up the process? Well, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Chair, um, Mason states that, uh, that, we are, that not one house or body has uh, control over another or, or preference over another, that we need to work collaboratively to define 
uh, when we're going to meet and what the agendas are going to be. Uh, my staff had reached out to your staff uh, earlier this week to try to arrange that ability to do that today. Um, we haven't met to talk about meeting times. We haven't met to talk about agendas. We don't have the documentation to be able to compare the two bills side by side, which is the purpose of this conference committee, because the bill that passed your, house, your body and the, and the uh, bill that passed our body are extremely different, and I think it's important for the members to understand those differences. We haven't talked about the gavel. I noticed that uh, you've already posted a meeting for Monday, and yet we haven't even talked about while the joint rules say that, uh, uh, that, that we trade every 24 hours, tradition had said that uh, we, we switch the gavel uh, every, every other meeting. We haven't talked about testifiers. We haven't talked about adopting same and similars. We haven't talked about when we're going to mark up the bill. Uh, Chair Mahoney, you, you, you didn't ask me if we could meet today and try to, and try to accommodate my members. You informed me that we were meeting today, and that's not the way to start off this uh, 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 this conference committee. Um, I don't know. Do you do you do you and and I believe you said you're uh, co-chairing this committee with uh, Chair Wigenius? Um Yeah. Yes and no. I mean, she will be holding the gavel on th on Monday, but after that, I'm. I am looking forward to chairing the committee when it is the House. Mr. Mr. Chair and, and uh, Chair Wagenius, do you have the authority to negotiate these items that we typically negotiate as part of a conference committee, or do I need to wait until I can chat with the Speaker about this? I Who's think, in charge here? I think you have to talk to me, Ms. Uh, Representative, uh, Senator Pratt. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm glad to hear that you have the authority to do it, because when we spoke uh, the other night before my members were announced, um, you seemed unwilling to even engage in this conversation. Um, and it certainly feels like this is being uh, uh, driven by the speaker because you and I have had a good working relationship throughout the session until this time. Um, but now you're disrespecting uh, me, you're disrespecting my chamber, and you're disrespecting my members. Senator Pratt, um I don't feel that I've disrespected your chamber. Um, I informed you that I was uh, planning on holding a Friday hearing. Yes, it was prior to your conferees being, uh, being named. Um, I gave you uh, a, a sense of what was going to be gone over. Um, you know, I'm disrespecting the chamber. Um, well, I'll just leave it at that. I gave you a heads up on what was what we as the chair or the with the gavel for the first particular meeting were planning. Um, you certainly uh, expressed some concerns, and um, we left it at that. Now. Disrespecting a chamber by saying we're going to meet on Friday, uh, even before your conferees were named. Uh, I don't know what the idea, other than one or two of them might not ha might have missed a, a opening uh, committee hearing where we would have gone over these three bills or a side and side by side uh, would have had effect on this. Your concern about when we're going to mark up a bill. You know, if there's something that we can agree on on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday of next week, I think that's part of the markup. And that's what I would intend to do and move on from there. Um, but we can spend the next two hours talking about uh, that particular, those particular issues that you want to bring up, and I'm fine with that. Uh, or we can move on and get this uh, done, and maybe you and I can have that particular meeting that, you've been, that you're asking for. Well, and thank you for that, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, uh, I think we do have to have that meeting, but you know, I'll refer to Mason 771, uh, item 3, because the two houses have equal authority is not proper for either to appoint the time or place for a conference. And that's exactly what happened here. Mr. Chair, you have broken uh, uh, the very rule in Mason's that helps to govern the process that this goes through. And if we're going to have 
a, a, a collaborative working agreement so that we can do the work for the people of Minnesota and pass a budget on time, then we have to start from the beginning and not be told this is when we're having it and I'm not moving it and I'm not considering the needs and the schedules of your members. It's inappropriate and it's, and it's against Masons where the, the uh, joint rules are silent on that issue. Senator Pratt, <clears throat> I've sat on I think four, this is my fourth or fifth um, conference committee. When it comes to conference time, there is no member schedule. There is no member commitment. These, this is what's important and this is what needs to get done. Do we all have issues that we have to deal with? Yes. That's why we have very confident, competent staff and have other members. I'm sure that's what's gone over today in this particular uh, conference committee meeting. You can certainly inform your members that had other commitments or chose to meet those commitments more of a priority than um, uh, the conference committee. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, I appreciate that, and I know my members are, are eager to get to work um, looking at the differences in the bill. But again, I'll refer back to Mason's uh, 771 uh, item three that says that we have equal authority and it is, is not proper for either to appoint the time or place for a conference. And Mr. Chair, when you came and talked to me, I wasn't even appointed to this conference committee. I didn't have the authority to accept. Um, it may have been that I wasn't the chair of uh, the Senate chair of this committee. And, uh, and, and as Mason states, it is not proper uh, for you to do that. We should have gone through the very items that I discussed so that we were in agreement on how this conference committee would flow. Um, and Mr. Chair, this is, a, this is a violation of our rules. While our joint rules are silent on it, we, go, we usually go back to custom and usage and then Masons, and both would say that this is an improper hearing. Senator Pratt, um, I went back I will go back to custom and usage, um, and I understand that the chair of the first meeting has always set the time and the place. I want to be careful here. Um, so uh, I don't believe this is an improper meeting. If you're not comfortable being here, if it's a because it's an improper meeting, there's a door. Well, Mr. Chair, uh, you know, thank you very much. Hey, there'll be no demonstrations from the audience. Well, thank you for that, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, thank you for your comments, Mr. Chair. It is in our joint rules that this is a House file uh, and that by rule you do have the gavel first. But again, I'll refer back to Masons, that neither, chair, neither House, neither body uh, were, were equals and that one shall not uh, uh, singularly determine the time and the place. We're supposed to be working on that together. Custom and usage would say that we should be working on the, the agendas for these meetings uh, collaboratively. Um, and custom and usage would say that the first order of business is to walk through the bills, differences between the side-by-sides, to compare where we're alike, where we're not alike, and, and, and really identify those areas that we have to spend the time, our time on. And to have basically to rehash a House hearing, I believe is not in the best interest in, in, the, in the use of time for this conference committee. Now, I'm not going to leave. I, I like information as much as anybody else. I'm just telling you, this is an improper uh, conference committee. We're not doing the work of the people. Uh, we're just making this a political show, and I think the people of Minnesota are really tired of this stuff, Mr. Chair. We should be getting, letting our staff focus on getting the bill comparisons done so that Monday we can start the work of resolving the differences in these bills so that we can get them back to our chambers in time. Well, Rep Senator Pratt, um, I believe, uh, if I might ask a question of your staff, when did they receive the... Um, the copy from uh, the reviser 
Have they had a day? Have they had three days? Have they had ten hour, two hours to review them? How long does it typically take to review those particulars? I don't want to throw the staff members underneath the bus, but um, and I, so I'm not going to ask that particular question, but I believe they've had significant time, and if they had that, we could have gone over those here. But I chose not to. I believe that the paid family leave, earned sick and safe time, and wage theft are su su sufficiently important to the, the citizens of the state of Minnesota that they should have a hearing here. Now, if you want to continue this particular argument, I'm fine. I've got, I've scheduled two hours for this hearing. I've got two hours. We can continue to do that, uh, or we could open it up to a vote of the body, seeing so that's typically, um, if you want to override Mason's rules or custom and usage, you just open it up. But I don't, I think basic arithmetic says that's probably a bad idea for you. Well, Mr. Chair, uh, the rules would say that's that's bad for you because without us, without a Senate quorum, we can't conduct any business. We can't override the rules. It takes, in fact, in order to override the rules, it takes a two-thirds vote of each, each body separately. And without a quorum of the Senate, you can't do that. Lucky for you. I don't know if it's lucky for me, Mr. Chair. It's the rules, and the rules are the rules, and that's what I'm trying to do: is abide by the rules that we have, which say that we abide by the joint rules, custom and usage. And Masons, so, and everything I've and everything I've quoted today, Mr. Chair, about why this is an improper meeting, has been from one of those three sources. And I informed you uh, on Wednesday that our staff was telling me that based on the differences between the two bills, the structure of the two bills, your bill is structured much differently than mine. That it was unlike it, there was a chance that we wouldn't have those comparisons ready today. But then you went ahead and set an agenda even before we knew those, those bill comparisons weren't going to be ready uh, in such a way that even if they were, we wouldn't be taking on the work that this conference committee is primarily established to do. The work that this conference committee is primarily established to do is to do the work of the, state of, of the people of the state of Minnesota. And again, as I say, the work of the people of Minnesota is how do we take care of the people of Minnesota, whether it's through the budget or through the policy issues that are in front of our particular committee. I set this committee up, I set this hearing up today um, after informing you that I was. Uh, I would have found it rather strange if you had not been appointed the chair of this particular committee, although um, stranger things happen up here in either body. Um, so, Representative Senator Pratt, um, what do you want to do? Do you want to just have disband this particular committee and not hear about paid family leave? Do you want to not hear about uh, earn sick and safe time? Or, you know, you have heard about wage theft because you have a bill on wage theft. Mr. Chair, I would suggest that we adjourn this meeting uh, you and I and Chair Wiginius, along with our staffs, go through and set and establish the protocol that we're going to use to, to govern these hearings so that we can be orderly um, in how we address, as you said, the work of the people for the, of the state of Minnesota, because that's what we're here to do. And Mr. Chair, this is a budget year. The primary function we have to do is to fund state government this year for the next biennium. The deadline that we face is primarily a budget deadline. Um, neither one of our bodies, neither one of our leaders, both of our leaders, I should say, have, have uh, committed to getting the budget process done on time. And our staff's time would be much better used if they were working on the bill comparison so that we could focus on those budget items. And we are not ready to do that, Mr. Chair, and it's a waste of, and, and, and my folks, uh, uh, have already wasted a half an hour? <laughs> Mr. Chair, I don't think uh, uh, talking about governance of this committee is wasting any time. Mr. Chair. Uh, I, th I think, uh, uh, excuse me, I'm, I, I think I still have the floor. Um, I think that uh, uh, making sure that the Senate and the House are working together in a collaborative manner, it should be of utmost importance to this committee and to the people of Minnesota and to both of our bodies. And this is not, uh, this has not been a collaborative process. This is not, we have not established how we're going to run the committee. Um, 
we don't have the information that we need in order to do uh, a good review of the two bills. And uh, I would say, and, and again, Mr. Chair, I would argue that our, the time of our staff is better used getting prepared for a Monday hearing. Representative Wiginius, did you have a, a question or a comment? Well, if, just to, just to note I'll is a matter of many, conference committees can be set up in so many different ways. And uh, I have been on conference committees where uh, the plan has been to get a lot of good information so that folks are on common ground uh, before we get started and even before we might have everything we need from staff. And, and that's the position we're in today. So we can get this good information and have that done and be ready on, I don't know whether you're gonna call a hearing tomorrow or not. Um, I mean, that I would be, but for sure on Monday, uh, when we have the gavel back again, we will certainly be going uh, over the side-by-sides uh, on energy and climate uh, on those areas. And hopefully getting through a lot of the work. Uh, I think we can do that because we can find some common ground. Uh, there's plenty we can find common ground on to get started. Go right ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Wiginius. I, I, I agree more. I think there is a lot of common ground we can find, and, and I'm looking forward to doing that. Uh, you're right. There are a lot of ways that a conference committee can be established and run, and, and, and not that this is necessarily an improper uh, uh, agenda. But what I'm saying, Representative Wiginius, is that uh, the violation of Masons was that uh, the House took the position that they were superior to the Senate in establishing this meeting, in establishing this agenda. We have not worked out how this was going to be uh, arranged. I'm sure if we'd have gotten together prior to this hearing, um, we could have agreed on what those agendas might be. But because this agenda was set, because this was time was set before the Senate conferees were established, before I was established as chair, uh, and because there's been absolutely no willingness of the House to confer with the Senate on what the agenda and the, and, and the uh, uh, process would be. It's an improper hearing and in violations of Mason's seven, uh, now I forgot the reference, right? Uh, uh, 771. Well, Mr. Representative Pratt, uh, Senator Pratt, I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to put, write that down and put it right in front of me. Senator Pratt, I believe the notification for this hearing came out 24 hours ago, after you were appointed as um, conferee chair. Um, it was, uh, Mr. Molnar, uh, when was this notification sent out and put on the web? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before 1 p.m. yesterday. Thank you. So I believe your conferees were appointed at that particular time. Um, and again, I made you aware of what I was going to do. Uh, I received a letter uh, objecting to that yesterday afternoon. I think I received it at 3.30 or 4 um, after this had gone out. Uh, you can cite Masons all you want. You can continue to delay this particular hearing as you like, um, and that's fine. Uh, but today we will hear on paid family leave, we will hear on uh, earned sick and safe time, and we will hear on, on wage stuff. So if you want to continue your objections, feel free. I don't find them valid, and I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to ignore them. I will register them, and I will try to work with you in the future. But I believe I was within my rights to set this particular hearing. Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, Senator Pratt had noted that these bills had been heard in the House before. Uh, I didn't have the pleasure of sitting on the Jobs Committee, so I didn't have the opportunity to hear our earn sick and safe time. Uh, I did get a chance to hear paid family leave, but that was early in the committee process, and it's uh, made, I think, 10 committee stops and had a number of changes. So uh, I very much am looking forward to this hearing. I think this is valuable information that will be useful in the discussions ahead as we get into the weeds uh, and the side-by-sides, I think having a common basis for 
understanding of some of these more complicated provisions would be very helpful. And so I'm hoping that we can hear from our witnesses today. Mr. Chair? Any final comments? Uh, well, Mr. Chair, I don't know if they're final yet, but uh, if, you'd, if you would uh, uh, accommodate me, I'd appreciate it if I could just respond to Representative Certainly. Long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Long, uh, I, I appreciate your comments and, and that you haven't had a chance to see these uh, uh, recently. Um, you also haven't had a chance to hear or see any of the Senate provisions. And uh, I know that this is probably your, your first conference committee, um, but typically part of the process is understanding where we're the same and where we're different and not to rehash all the bills that were heard in the committee. I've had four months worth of hearings. And if we were to go through every hearing and every bill that's in our, in, in our version of this report, and we were to go through every version of the bills that are in your report, we will never get to the budget. We will never get to the point where we fund our, our, uh, our agencies. We will never get to the point where we are able to wrap up this committee on time. Uh, we distributed the, in fact, I know we distributed the letter, Mr. Chair, before the, uh, uh, the hearing was, was posted, uh, but uh, Mr., uh, if, and, and you can answer Mr. Weeks, um, the, was this, uh, uh, once you heard of the Senate's uh, uh, objections to this, whether it was before or after you posted it, but we sent the letter before, um, were you, uh, did you reach out to my staff to coordinate the agenda? I suspect we we made an attempt. I don't know if it was successful. Mr. Chair, uh, may I ask uh, when that uh, when that attempt was made and when you wanted to meet? Um, I'll have to ask my CA when that was done. Wednesday afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We didn't have our conference committee appointed on Wednesday afternoon. Well, Senator Pratt. Um, Again, I have rarely seen a um, chair of the committee, the author of the bill, not be appointed. So uh, if you want us to wait until the Senate moves along and gets to all of its particular things and uh, appointments and, and uh, stuff that they have to, or feel that they have to do before we even contact you, uh, it wouldn't matter whether we are supposed to be done on the 13th of, um, of May or the 13th of December. Well, and thank you. And if you want it, in, in, and I have brought forth these three bills because I know they're important to the House chamber. My intent was to not bring forth any other bills. Um, but if, you know, your four months of hearing, uh, I don't know how many bills I've heard. But if you want to go over all of them again, um, uh, we again, we would be done on December thirteenth or whenever. So, I brought these four, these three forth. I find your, um, as the chair of the committee, I find your objections noted. I'm asking them to be noted. Uh, and Representative Wiginius, I'd actually like to move on with this. So, um, duly noted. And I'm going to. Um, well, uh, if you want to speak a little bit more, I guess we can, but as soon as the witness comes back, we will move forward. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, being in this Senate, I'm, I'm used to filibustering, so I can, I can hold on until uh, well, Representative Halderson's back. If, if I may interrupt you, Representative Wigini has had a question or a comment. Well, it, and then we'll go back to you until so the witness much, comes. Uh, the, uh, a question is a comment that I would expect that... Could you speak into the mic? Sure. I would expect as there are some provisions that you bring forward that we have never heard about, uh, that you would bring folks in to talk to us because we all make better decisions when we have good information. And I'm going to want to hear the good information that the Senate has on some of the energy provisions that I'm not familiar with. So I think we can accommodate each other here and move forward. Um, with the notion that we're going to be listening to you and to those that you bring forward, um, because the bottom line is it's good information that we make for good decision making, and that is what we need right now is just to say let's get going, 
let's bring in this good information and expect the same from the Senate uh, as we go through the side by side. There are going to be times we're going to want to bring in information, and we'll want to bring in information. Mr. Chair, would briefly because uh, we're going to go to the witness. would Representative McGinnis yield for a, a question? Sure, <coughs> Uh, Representative McGinnis, so you're going to have the uh, the gavel on Monday, supposedly. You've posted a meeting. You've posted an agenda. Uh, have you reached out to uh, my committee administrator to establish that agenda, or Mr. Reese, or any any of your staff? Uh, I actually haven't, and I wouldn't expect that I would be setting the agenda when you have the gavel. That's just uh, that's not how I have ever been in a conference committee. Uh, the, it, it is the person who is chairing that day that sets the agenda. And we talk back and forth, but uh, having no control over, uh, and I don't expect to have control over your agenda, and I actually don't want control over your agenda. I think that's, that's your, your job, and my job is to do it on the days that uh, we are doing the energy articles. So. Uh, I think we can. I think we can move on. We we can find. It's time to find some common ground here, and uh, be listening. For, so it's time for some Mr. listening. Mr. Chair, I, I promise this will be my final comment. Re Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, uh, I, I guess to a point with uh, uh, that, that Chair Wagenius uh, uh, established is that you're right. Uh, it is the chair's prerogative to assign the agenda. But custom and usage would say that we go through these inventory of items in order to make sure that the conference committee work is effective and efficient. And the fact that the House is taking on breaking Mason 771 by not by, by assuming that they are a superior body when we're supposed to be equals yeah. according according to the uh, uh, according to the rules, by not conferring with the other body on meeting time, meeting place, I, although I believe our, our, our leaders did agree to the place, so I'll, I'll, I'll concede that point, but to the meeting time uh, and to the agenda that custom and usage would say that we normally do, the governance of this committee has broken down. The committee process has become hyper-partisan, and I am extremely concerned that the Senate is here in good faith to get the work of the people of Minnesota done and to get a budget and a conference report completed and that the House has turned this into a partisan show that is designed to, well, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I won't try to uh, uh, infer uh, uh, intent. I almost went there, but uh, this is, in my view, uh, a hyper-partisan show and put, seriously puts at jeopardy the ability of this committee to get its work done on time. And with that, Mr. Chair, those will be my final comments yep. around governance, but I, I am uh, gravely disappointed uh, at the way that we're starting this committee hearing off. Representative Halverson, would you like to uh, address the committee about paid family leave? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, appreciate the time to uh, check in with folks about paid family and medical leave. This is a, a uh, bill that has made it through uh, 10 committees in the House, as, as was mentioned, and changed quite a bit along every stop based on input uh, from debate um, and input from stakeholders. Um, briefly, I'll let you know kind of who participates and, uh, and uh, what the outcomes we expect from paid family medical leave are. Um, I'll start by saying that uh, this is an outcome from a legislative uh, legislation that was passed in 2015. Um, the legislature asked um, for a study on how Minnesota would implement paid family and medical leave, and this reflects um, the work that was done through the commission of that study um, with, through the University of Minnesota. Um, along the way, lots of folks have been consulted from around um, the country, um, perhaps even around the world. Uh, Minnesota is the only uh, country other than Papua New Guinea that does not provide some type of paid family and medical leave benefits um, for its citizens. Um, currently, about 14% of Minnesotans are covered by some type of paid family or medical leave. Um, and it's been typically through large employers who have an economy of scale to offer these types of benefits that make them much more competitive in the, in the, in the employment marketplace, especially now that the employment uh, marketplace is so um, tight. And our large employers around in Minnesota are actually participating in these types of plans in other states and if they're global around the world. 
Um, so the way that um, the, the paid family medical leave proposal is put together in this particular bill is that um, employers who participate um, pay a small premium um, that they share 50 percent with their employer. The premium is 0.6 of a percent. Um, because it says 0.6, a lot of people express it as 6 percent. It is 0.6 of a percent. So I want that to be very clear. Um, and that is split equally. So it would be 0.3 for employers, 0.3 for employees. Um, and from that, uh, participants get up to 12 weeks of paid medical leave. Um, you can think of that as a bed rest during a complicated pregnancy, um, the, uh, a, fall, a slip and fall on the ice where somebody um, might suffer a traumatic brain injury, um, a skiing accident, um, a cancer diagnosis. Um, that's medical leave. Um, and then um, a, a member could also uh, opt for a family leave situation. That would be to bond with a new baby. Um, so there's, there's a little bit of joy in this bill, but uh, very often um, folks are needing to take leave um, f uh, to care for a loved one who might be dying, to um, help a loved one who is um, uh, undergoing uh, hospitalization, cancer treatment, um, those types of things. And um, all of the leaves would be obtained through an application process through deed um, that would mirror uh, the rules around fed federal unpaid leave currently. So employers are very familiar with um, the, the uh, uh, unpaid leave program that is available through the federal government currently. Um, it doesn't help Minnesotans a whole lot. It makes Minnesotans leave about $383 million of, of wages on the table um, if they do take unpaid leave. And a lot of folks I know um, end up going back to work too soon. One in uh, four women uh, ha go back to work uh, two weeks after giving birth, which is um, dangerous for the mother and dangerous for the baby. Um, but a lot of people can't make that choice of going without a paycheck. Um, so this helps um, ease that choice and, and the outcomes uh, are very positive from a health perspective. We look at um, much more positive health outcomes uh, for newborns, for mothers, increased uh, breastfeeding, which has tremendous health benefits. We also see, um, as is evidenced uh, from other plans around the country, um, lower participation, lower need for uh, participation in public programs among people who have to leave the workforce because they can't make the, that um, decision between getting a paycheck and taking care of themselves or a loved one. Um, lower uh, rates of rehospitalization from an illness, lower rates of uh, professional respite care in nursing homes. Um, these are all kind of problems we're trying to solve as a state. Um, within our budget currently and paid family leave actually is a step toward helping the state solve those problems. Um, child care is another major issue that we're dealing with at the state and um, this also makes a big difference in terms of people being to um, find a place. Newborn child care is the most expensive <laughs> that, that there is and um, a lot of families uh, can't access the child care that they need and paid family leave gives um, the families time to uh, adequately take care of a newborn baby. Now there are private plans in place as I mentioned about 14 percent of employees are already covered by private plans. Those private plans um, this can continue um, as long as they meet the um, salary payback that is, is contained within um, the, the state's plan. And very often an employer will have a medical leave plan through short-term disability that pays out at a higher rate. It's a better plan, right, than, than what we're um, uh, putting out uh, through, through, through the state plan. And, and those can continue, those private plans can continue. At the same time, um, private uh, family leave plans are less common. There's not a lot of products out there on the market yet um, through the insurers. And um, so, uh, an employer could opt into one or both of those, those programs um, as long as they maintain a private plan um, in the other program. In addition, um, we worked very closely with organizations who represent independent contractors like real estate agents and uh, um, 
insurance agents and others who hang out their own shingle. Um, we wanted to be sure that, that those folks uh, could take advantage of the benefits as well. So they have the option to opt in. They're not automatically enrolled. They have the option to opt in and pay the employee only premium rate. We wanted the premium to be very accessible for people. Um, I heard a lot from people who hang out their own shingles who said um, that this would be a game changer in their lives to, to have that security of being able to take leave um, from their own business. Because if you're not working, you're not getting paid in your own business either, right? Um, and so uh, that's, that's just a little bit of an overview of how the program works. Um, I would like to share a little bit about what we've heard in terms of the impact among Minnesota employees. And uh, the stories have been pretty phenomenal. Um, and it really emphasizes that no one is kind of immune from the need for this. Um, and in fact, we're seeing about 400,000 Minnesotans take necessary leaves, um, but they don't get paid for it. That's a lot of money that gets left on the table um, that is not in employees' uh, pockets and uh, really hinders them from being able to participate fully in the economy when, when you're um, not drawing your paycheck and you don't have economic security. Um, I would just close by saying that uh, it's a program whose time has come. Um, we have been talking about this as a state for a very, very long time. And uh, the work that we've done on this bill really, I think, shows that uh, an effective program is possible here in the state of Minnesota. I have no doubt that it's something that Minnesota employers are asking us uh, to do when they can't afford to offer their own plan. Minnesota employers have led the way in a lot of ways on uh, robust paid family leave programs when they have been able to afford it because they know that it is a game changer when it comes to employee recruitment and intention, retention. And uh, we want to be able to attract the best and brightest to our state, and this is an important way to do that. There are a couple of folks who would like to speak um, to the bill, and I would turn it over at that time and, and take questions as people desire. Mm -hmm. um, please identify yourself for the tape. Proceed, Commissioner. Chair Mahoney and members of the committee, my name is Steve Grove, and I'm the Commissioner of the Department for Employment and Economic Development. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for having me. Uh, the governor, the lieutenant governor, all of us in the Wallace Lending Administration are very excited about this piece of legislation. Uh, Representative Halverson is right. This is an idea whose time has come, and it's also a big idea, and this is a time when we need big ideas. We face in this state uh, a worker shortage that is greater than it's been in modern memory. Uh, the job vacancy report in Q4 of 2018 said we have 137,000 open jobs in the state that we haven't been able to fill. Minnesota has to differentiate itself as a great place to work. And it's policies like this that we think will really help our businesses, especially our small businesses who can't afford to have these kinds of programs themselves, attract uh, new workers, attract workers to stay, and to build loyalty amongst their employees for the kinds of uh, policies that will uh, make it possible for life to happen to them without their lives having to unravel. And we spent the morning over at the Capitol with advocates, small business owners, uh, the governor, the lieutenant governor, and myself, Commissioner Lepping, held a press conference with many of these advocates. The stories they will tell you are powerful, uh, they're emotional. People who face challenges uh, in their lives and aren't able to be paid when they take step aside from work, um, can, it can be the, 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 the shift from being uh, in, in a stable situation to getting into great debt. And so it's policies like this that will keep workers uh, in the game. Um, studies show that if you, or particularly if you're a woman who takes time, uh, paid time off to take care of a baby, 10 years later, your participation rates in the labor force are way higher than women who weren't able to take paid time off uh, during that period of time. 82% retention of, of, of uh, female workers in the workforce after taking these paid leaves. Um, I myself and my wife and I uh, were able to take paid family uh, leave from our company a couple years ago when we had two-year-old twins. Um, as a dad of twins, uh, I know that it takes a lot in those early days to take care of your, your little ones, and we were very lucky to work for a company that had paid family medical leave. But 28% of Minnesota companies don't have any kind of paid family medical leave at all. And uh, that's a problem, and it affects primarily uh, low-income uh, workers and, and more often than not uh, populations of color in the state. And so 
I think there's a moral issue here, here at stake too in terms of who, who we're taking care of with, with the government's uh, programs and policies. So we think this is a really important issue. Um, we're excited to push forward on it. Um, there were people, there'll be people who will tell you that this doesn't work for business, that this uh, payroll tax makes it harder to do business in the state. Um, I would encourage us to look at other states who have put programs like this into place because we are not the first. Um, New Jersey and California have both put these programs into place and when you survey the employers in those states about how it's gone so far, the results are really clear. In New Jersey, um, of, of 18 employers who were surveyed after the first couple of years of the program, um, all but ones that had an actual positive improvement on their productivity and their workforce in those companies. Uh, in California, you saw a similar story where a vast majority reported positive <coughs> results to their uh, productivity, profitability, turnover, and morale. So the states that are smart enough to get going on this before others are benefiting, uh, we would love Minnesota to be one of those states as well and would be thrilled to pass this legislation and, and put it into place a deed. Um, a quick note on how it would work, uh, Representative Halverson was, was, I think, pretty clear on this, but just to reiterate from Dee's perspective, uh, the policy would uh, essentially mirror how we do unemployment insurance in the state, so that payroll tax would, would make this program pay for itself over time. Uh, our budget ask for this cycle is to actually build the, the, the technical infrastructure and the administrative staff to, to build out a team to take in those, those payments and the payroll tax uh, to get that, that, um, that fund built up so that once we're up and running, it pays for itself through that that 0.6% uh, payroll tax that Representative Halverson mentioned. So um, DDA has some good experience in this space, having built the UI system for our state and would be eager to get going on paid family medical leave too. So uh, thanks for having me here today and uh, thrilled to keep this conversation going. Mr. Moore, I, I think I'm not sure I heard you. Um, how many, what percentage don't have paid fam, pay, any kind of paid family leave in the state of Minnesota? Do you, our numbers tell us that currently between 26 and 28 percent of workers in the state have no kind of paid leave uh, option from their current employers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, did you have a question, Senator Pike? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could just follow up on your question. Certainly. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Grove. Uh, I, I thought the chair asked a pretty pointed question and you gave a pretty broad answer. So could you... Uh, could you please um, uh, maybe specify it? You said uh, 26 to 28 percent have no paid leave, but he specifically asked about uh, family leave. Sorry, paid leave, so f unpaid family leave? Sorry, what's the difference well, you're trying to thank, make? Mr. Chair? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and, and Commissioner Grove. Um, federal government says that uh, uh, all employers must uh, provide 12 weeks of, of unpaid leave. And so that's not the question. I mean, every one of our employees in the state is covered by the federal law, uh, mm -hmm. the federal FMLA law. What the chair asked, I thought, was how many of them, what percentage of our employers uh, do not have paid family and medical leave? And you said 26 to 28 percent of, percent of our employees don't have any paid leave. To me, that would include uh, all, all sorts of uh, personal time off or any, uh, you know, any, any classification. And I'm wondering if you could just specifically answer the, the chair's question. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Mr. Pratt. Moore. Uh, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, so currently, 26 to 28 percent of all family and medical leaves are without any wage replacement. Thank you. That clarifies, that clarifies your answer. Okay. Mr. Chair. Representative Long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to follow up on this question. So um, the FMLA does not apply to all employers in, in Minnesota, right? Or at least they're, if you're under 50 employer employees, then you don't have to follow FMLA. Is that accurate? Um, Mr. Chair and Representative Long, if, if it's okay with you, Mr. Chair, um, our technical support is here. Um, uh, Professor Fitz Fitzpatrick from the U has all of the data at her fingertips. So if uh, she can answer, that would be helpful. Um, Mr. Chair, no, no, I'm actually, order, no, I'm gonna take care of this one. Um, I have indicated that it would be just one testifier. I understand that you have all the data at your fingertips, but um, uh, we're gonna ask that question uh, or direct that to the commissioner. And if he can't answer it, I'm sure we'll be able to get it in writing and pass it along to the rest of the committee. 
Mr. Uh, Chair, President Long, could you repeat the question one more time for me, please? Sorry to make you do that. No problem, uh, Mr. Chair, um, Commissioner. So my understanding is that uh, only employers over 50 employees are covered by FMLA. Is that accurate? Yes, that's accurate. Yes. So that would, to the commissioner, to the to the uh, testifier, to Representative uh, Halverson, that would expand that list considerably. Follow up, Mr. Chair, and then employees are only able to take FMLA if they've been in service for over one year. So there's a number of employees who, even if they are working for an employer who is over 50 employees, can't take it in any given year, I believe. And I think that percentage is, is pretty high. I don't, I don't have it at my fingertips, but I thought it was as high as 45% of employees. 45%, I'm getting a thumbs up, of employees can't take it in any given year. Mr. Chair, Representative, I would just add to this issue of smaller companies and how it affects them. Uh, one of the things that I think has come out of this bill as it's gone through committees is an is a increased focus on how to help smaller companies weather those moments when someone has to take a leave. And so Representative Halverson and, and other legislators have built a, a, a waiver program essentially that gives a small amount of money to smaller companies to hire temporary workers when their employees leave if they're at 50 or under employers. And so it's those kinds of things that I think will help smaller companies with this policy. Mr. Chair, and so just to be clear, so that's, that 45% is uh, people who can't take unpaid family leave currently. And so we're, we're talking about a pretty big gap when folks can't even take unpaid leave and now we're uh, hoping to get them paid leave. And uh, just one question if you will oblige, Mr. Chair. So uh, uh, Chair Halverson, you mentioned the small employees and the competitiveness and Commissioner Grove, you mentioned that as well. Mm -hmm. I had a number of small employee employers uh, visit me today mm -hmm. and a couple of them shared personal stories about their business, one who said, we can't compete with a number of other companies because even though our salaries are competitive, our benefits are not, and we're not big enough to be able to pool to work in that, um, in that marketplace to provide things like paid family leave. And another employer said, we had uh, individuals leave when they got pregnant and go work for somebody else because they knew that they couldn't take paid leave for us. And so they're actually losing employees as small employers. So I just wanted to see if, if we have uh, any uh, uh, any other data to back up how folks, uh, how small business owners here are losing out? Well, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Long, um, from the testimony that we heard, um, and uh, like you talking to, to small business owners, this is how small business owners lose when they can't, uh, to your, and you made the exact right point, this is about sharing risk. And if you're sharing risk among a large group, you can share, you can get the benefits for a much lower cost. And so this is a 0.3% uh, premium that we're talking about. Um, but by not having these programs in pay, place, they lose employees and, and hearing from a tech uh, company owner who said, um, she said, they tell me specifically that they are leaving to go to big companies for the paid family and medical leave. Um, and they don't want to leave her small employer, their small employer and the small business, but um, it's this necessary for families. Um, number two, um, they, they lose um, because they tend not to want to leave their own employees out in the, the cold. And so very often um, we're hearing stories about employer, small employers covering these types of leave for people out of their own pocket, out of their own um, salaries as business owners. And it, it's clear to me uh, hearing their stories that the smaller your business, the more your employees are family. And they're not um, wanting to just turn them out, leave them in the cold. And so um, having... Uh, these, these, so these types of programs, this type of program would cover both employers and employees because these small employers wouldn't be putting their own um, financial security at risk in order to take care of uh, their uh, sick or injured employee. Representative Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Representative Halverson, you know, I think um, we talked a lot about how this is going to benefit people sort of in, in traditional employment and even uh, people who are self-employed. You know, when I had both of my children, I was lucky enough to work for a large company that had a paid leave policy and they was able to take paid leave with both children uh, that I've had. But I know a lot of people don't work for large companies that offer those benefits. A lot of people don't work for large companies, period, or don't have a full-time job. Increasingly, we're seeing people who are stitching together multiple part-time positions or filling up one part-time position with a, a gig economy job as an Uber driver or, or something else, or maybe working as an independent contractor, staking out on their own. And that's a great 
you know, great and growing share of our economy, people working multiple part-time jobs or working for themselves. Can you talk about how this bill impacts that population? Because I feel like we're focusing a lot on <coughs> the traditional model of employment, which is fading away. Mr. Chair and Representative Stevenson, um, you raise an excellent point. And, and the benefits in this case um, follow the employee. So um, once they've worked and paid into the, the program, the benefits are theirs. And so if they are working multiple part-time jobs, um, the benefit would be based off of their, 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 the premium benefit is based off of their overall earnings and um, isn't, isn't tied to one specific job or tied to the need to work a certain amount of hours in a week. Um, it, it follows the employee. So it does uh, maintain economic security for people who are um, having to piece together um, their their work for uh, whatever reason they're choosing to do it. You're absolutely right. This is a lot of the way a lot of people are working right now. Do you have a follow up? No, Mr. Chair. Um, why don't you have Kellen come down, Ms. Lady, the ladies, and I'll go up and do mine. Yes, oh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Representative, uh, Senator Pratt. I put on my pin, Mr. Chair, so you'd know that we were. Yeah, I've never worn a pin up here. <laughs> It's a big uh, issue for me. Mr. Chair, before we, before we move on to wage theft, where we have a lot more uh, in agreement than, than uh, not, uh, I think I have several questions regarding this provision. If we're going to actually have this hearing, I'd like to make it a Go productive it. hearing. Go for it. Uh, Commissioner Grove or, or Representative Halverson, um, uh, Representative Long mentioned the federal, the federal threshold of uh, 50 employees. Uh, it's my understanding Minnesota is has a, a, a more stringent uh, family and medical leave policy, and can you can describe that, please? Mm, which one would like to take that particular one? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Pratt, which uh, family? Uh, Senator please. Pratt. I'm sorry. I'm bad enough. We don't need to add to this. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Halverson, I know that uh, I'm the only one here representing the Senate, but uh, and, and I'm not dressed like a senator, so I understand how I can blend in. Well, you're, you're welcome to, to be cash over here if you want, sir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could you clarify Halverson, the you... program that you're describing? Thank you. Uh, 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 Ma'am, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Great. Chair and, and Representative Halverson. Uh, so we talked about the federal FMLA, and, and Representative Long identified that it, it, there's a threshold of 50 employees. It's my understanding that uh, Minnesota law is more stringent uh, and covers more employees under FMLA. And I was wondering if you or the commissioner could describe the differences between uh, uh, Minnesota law and how many of our employees now under the Minnesota statute are not covered. Because uh, the 45 percent, while a shocking number, uh, doesn't seem to be accurate. Uh, based on current statute. Uh, Representative Halverson. Mr. Chair and Representative Pratt, it's... Uh, Senator it's, Pratt, please. Sorry, Senator Pratt, my apologies. Um, if uh, it, the numbers might not look like they match up because we're not doing apples to apples comparisons. Um, and so when you say the paid, fam or you say family medical leave for the state of Minnesota, it's actually um, only... A, a a family leave and it's only for new parents so it's very very narrow so it's not a bro the broad kind of programs that we're comparing it to um, with other types of leave so it's for employers uh, 20 with 21 and 21 and over employees and it's um, in the first year for new parents thank you Mr. Mr. Pratt. Chair and, and representative Halverson so uh, how many employees are not covered because it certainly doesn't sound like 45 percent as, as was testified to before uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Pratt. Um, Senator Pratt. Oh, sorry, I'm Senator member, Pratt. I think I think I'm going to ask staff to write a get a big sign, big sign that says "Senators" with an arrow. Should we get and it points it around this side? Yeah, mm -hmm. Senator Pratt. Um, I, I'm not usually that picky about it, but uh, you know we are in a in a conference committee hearing, and and uh, I've already complained that. I don't feel like our chamber is getting the respect that it deserves, <laughs> uh, and so not to. Not to beat a dead horse, but uh, you know, that's. Well, I think I think you need to beat the dead horse. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I will beat the dead horse then. Um, so, again, how many employees are not covered under our current statute? Because it's certainly a lot less than 45 percent, I would presume. Sen uh, Representative Halverson. Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt. Um, again, it's not an apples to apples um, comparison, so. 
um, to say that the new parent statute gets us um, beyond that 45 um, uh, Forty five uh, percent, I think, is I think that we're looking at different uh, kind of analyses because that is a, a very limited benefit uh, to a limited population, new parents only. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Halverson. So we've got testimony that's not to apples to apples comparison to Minnesota law, and so we don't have, uh, and I presume that 45 percent of our employees that are in companies under 50. Uh, employees have been are not all under one year and have some sort of coverage and some percentage of them are women and some percentage that well and since we're talking about family leave and bonding it would be both men and women so I guess it's it's incorrect for me to make that presumption um, and that uh, we do in fact provide uh, time off so how many employees be how many employees are affected be 20, between 21 and 50 uh, employees uh, who would be who have worked at their places of employment less than a year that would not be covered under this that, that that are not covered today because I can't take this isn't an apples to apples comparison we're throwing out statistics as if they're fact to be able to show that we have this huge gap in uncovered employees as Representative Long testified or identified. And it's and it's not true. And so I'd like to have I'd like the committee if we're going to have this hearing and understand this bill. I'd like to have an understanding of exactly how many Minnesotans are being uh, affected or or left behind. Representative Halverson, um, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt, we're leaving um, thousands and thousands of employees behind. I would say uh, hundreds of thousands of employees behind because. Um, the leave that uh, is being addressed um, currently in federal and state law is not paid leave, and so we have 400. We've got it's you know 400,000 Minnesotans a year who take unpaid leave and put their economic security at risk. Um, at the same time, we have people who take um, uh, who don't take the leave that they need. Um, to recover from an illness or an injury or to recover from childbirth because they can't go without a paycheck. And so when you s ask about people who are uncovered, these are the people who are uncovered. Um, and we want a state where people can take um, leave after childbirth that um, is reasonable and, and not have to sacrifice uh, a paycheck and not have to put themselves at risk or, you know, or get cancer treatment and not put yourself at risk of of uh, medical uh, bankruptcies, which are, are far too common because you need to keep working or you lose your benefits and you have to go on um, public programs. Uh, those are the scenarios that um, demonstrate the ways that people are uncovered by current federal and state statute. <laughs> Senator you. Pratt. Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Halverson, but it still doesn't answer my question. The question that, that that, that I asked earlier and Representative Long clarified was around the federal FMLA, which is unpaid leave. And so there are certain employees that were identified, a number was thrown out at 45% aren't covered by the federal statute. Uh, I didn't ask about paid. Uh, and so I guess maybe the, the, the question goes to Commissioner Grove. Commissioner Grove, you were, uh, your agency was tasked with assessing this bill, um, what it was gonna take, um, what the bill uh, mandated. Um, I'm presuming that your staff did the analysis on how many new uh, uh, employees uh, would now be covered under this that, that don't currently have coverage. And so again, we threw out a number that there were 45% of working Minnesotans that aren't covered by the federal FMLA. And I'm wondering now under state statute where we lower that down to 21 employees, how many employees or what percentage Thousands of thousands is not an answer. Uh, that's not a fact. That's that's a presumption. Uh, how many employees are not covered under our current Minnesota statute for unpaid FMLA and aren't allowed to t and and aren't given the ability to take time off? Before you answer that, uh, uh, Commissioner, um, we're getting dangerously close to having to call up a second witness, and I do not want to do that. So, Senator Pratt if I might, uh, would you be comfortable if um, the commissioner or uh, Representative Halverson got that to you in writing uh, within the next 
uh, today or by Monday afternoon, because otherwise I'm going to have to call up the uh, the Aetna, the expert, and I again do not want to get too deep into witnesses here. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate that, and I would be happy to take that uh, that information in writing. Uh, um, Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative uh, Halverson. Uh, and just a quick comment, maybe, since we're going to beat the dead, since you gave me permission to beat a dead horse, I will. Representative Halverson, <laughs> you chair the, uh, uh, the House Commerce Committee, is that correct? Mr. Chair, that is correct. And uh, Representative Halverson, we have the, ch uh, the Senate has the chairs of the uh, uh, House, or the Energy, Jobs, and uh, Commerce Committee, all of which are wrapped up into this bill on the Conference Committee. Might I ask why you're not on this Conference Committee, since right. this is your bill? And since uh, and since your your uh, uh, committee is covered under this bill, Representative Halverson, um, Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, um, I'm serving on the HHS Conference Committee and the Opioids Conference Committees, so um, it was a bandwidth issue. Thank you, <laughs> Representative Halverson. I know we're all uh, uh, we're all very uh, we're, we're all stretched rather thin, uh, Mr. Chair. May I, Senator uh, Senator. No, you got it right this time. Yep. Senator Pratt. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Halverson, uh, the, the Commerce Committee has jurisdiction over insurance, and, and you identify this as a family medical benefit insurance program. Um, but as I look through the bill, it doesn't necessarily seem to be established or run like the only um, commonality that I see with an insurance program is that it's, it's that, pooled share, uh, that, that pooled sharing of risk, mm -hmm. which we tried with Minsure and ended up blowing up uh, uh, health care rates uh, to the point that uh, in 2017, the House, Senate, and Governor implemented a reinsurance program that actually brought down and, and stopped the skyrocketing uh, health insurance rates. Um, can you describe other than the shared pool of risk, um, how this would, uh, and, and we have, as, as you mentioned, there's not a robust market for uh, paid family leave, but we do have a robust market for uh, uh, short-term disability and wage replacement. And so can you tell me um, the similarities and differences between the insurance program that you would like the state to run versus what's available in the private market? Representative Halverson. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, the, um, I don't believe I called it an insurance program. I said it's modeled under unemployment insurance, but it's a, um, uh, you're correct. It's about pooling risk um, for Minnesota employers and employees so that they have economic security when they get ill, injured, or have a baby. Um, the, you're, and you're absolutely right that there's also a, quite a robust um, uh, short-term disability uh, market in the state of Minnesota. Um, and interestingly enough, in states where uh, fam family leave, paid family leave has, has been passed, um, that's where we're starting to see um, the private market come um, to the table with uh, private market plans for family leave. Um, so it's actually helping to drive um, some of that business innovation and business development. Um, but what we find is that those short-term disability plans, what we hear from small employers is that um, they are, are not affordable and they, they need an option that, that is uh, more affordable to them. Employers who have those programs in place, as I said, um, it appears that most of those programs are designed to pay out at a higher rate than, than the state's um, benefit is, is designed to pay out at. And so as long as an employer um, has a benefit that pays out um, the same wage replacement, um, those private plans can continue to move forward. Senator Pratt, uh, we have some, uh, I have another question over here. So if you're getting close to killing it, um, beating the dead horse. I, I, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chair, I have several more questions, but I'd be happy to yield to someone else for another question, if it's, particularly if it's along this point. Representative Malone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, it was uh, actually in response to your a previous question. So on the comparison of uh, paid family leave to unpaid family medical leave, there is a, a very big distinction, I think, that we need to make. There are a number of folks, uh, Minnesotans, who could afford to take uh, unpaid leave, but two-thirds of Minnesotans say that it would be a significant economic and financial hardship to take unpaid leave to care for a family member or to 
uh, for the birth of a child. So paid, paid leave is um, uh, not the same as unpaid leave and is uh, a much more important benefit for, the, for Minnesotans and one that they would value a lot more. And I might, and the testifier can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that there hasn't been research done in Minnesota yet of the uh, percentage of Minnesotans who have paid family leave. But if we're looking at paid family leave nationally, only 17% of individuals nationally have access to paid family leave. So we could expect, I think, similar percentages in Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I have one question for Representative Halverson. Um, if you have to sit and listen through a paid family leave bill more than six times, would that make you eligible for a paid leave? <laughs> <laughs> Did you Mr. have a Chair, comment? That would presume that uh, mental stress were covered under the, under the bill. Um, I, uh, I know you have a, a good number of other questions. Um, I am going to try and get at least the other two bills in here. So if you could wrap up relatively quickly. Well, Mr. Chair, and uh, you know, as was brought up earlier by Representative Long, um, you know, if we're going to hear these bills, we should give them mm -hmm. uh, a thorough vetting. And, and while I appreciate that, again, we didn't have a, the, the Senate didn't have an opportunity to weigh in on what the agenda would be, I would hope that uh, since you set the agenda, uh, and brought this bill forward for review that we would have uh, a fair opportunity to be able to uh, uh, question Representative Halverson uh, on, the, on the specifics of her bill. And Senator Pratt, that is fine with me. I just understand that we'd have to have another hearing where we go over paid, uh, earned sick and safe time and wage stuff. So we do have a, as you, as you kindly pointed out, we probably have a budget that we have to get done and you know just trying to move this along so we can find some some balance here but if well, you go mr. right ahead thank you mr chair and hopefully on monday we can amend the uh, uh we can amend the uh, uh agenda so that we can actually get to that budget work um on monday but uh representative halverson on you know i would say that uh on on uh line 45.10 uh, in statute, it is defined as an insurance program, and that's why I asked the question. Uh, uh, on uh, on page uh, on on line 46.4, uh, you state that the days do not have to be consecutive. Uh, can you can you elaborate on that? Uh, because uh, you know, if I take uh, a seven days over the year, am I now uh, paid for those seven days uh, retroactively? And and uh, or, or how does that work? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Pratt, you um, certainly uh, zero in on, on, on how complex the, the, it is to create and administer this program. And um, this idea of non-consecutive days comes from conversations with um, both employers and uh, people who need leave. Um, and uh, the scenario I think that best illustrates um, the need for unconsecutive days is um, chemotherapy treatment um, or... Um, partial bed rest um, for uh, a, a working mother. Um, there are, are times when people um, will be able to uh, work at their jobs, but not for full weeks. Um, if this is a uh, situation where you have a minimum of a seven day leave period, and you have uh, uh, you know, a, an incident that, that requires at least seven days of leave, and you have gone through the uh, approval process with uh, your employer and with uh, the commissioner of deed, um, which requires the uh, sign-off of a medical professional, then you have a plan that, that is put in place. Now, we worked with employers. It's not um, as somebody could take one day off a week to go to their chemo treatment. Um, a, a working mom could take, you know, half of a week uh, or to, um, you know, three days um, on bed rest, uh, work in the office, work from home. Um, as she works out with her employer. Because, because the bill offers partial wage replacement, not total wage replacement, we want to provide as much flexibility as possible for people to um, you know, work in a way that um, makes sure that they're continued to be protected through economic security. And, and uh, there are scenarios where people need partial leave for an extended period of Senator time. Senator Pratt. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Halverson. And we have a... Uh, uh, a handout going out uh, from United for Jobs uh, who discusses that uh, the mandate uh, for paid leave, and if enacted in Minnesota, would be the only state in the nation in which such expansive 
and expensive mandates in terms of eligibility, qualifying events, uh, benefits, and employer obligations. Uh, uh, and, and only six states, uh, California, New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and uh, Washington uh, have enacted versions that of, of the paid family uh, leave mandate. Uh, kind of getting back to your idea of the uh, uh, and and if someone and, and, and your bill states that they have to be uh, employed uh, during a quarter and if they are employed during a, a single quarter are they now uh, eligible for both the 12 weeks medical and the 12 weeks of bonding pay so I've worked for three months and I now get nearly six months off of paid leave is and, and even though my employer and I haven't paid in the premium to cover that cost Mr. Mr. Chair Representative Pratt the uh, Senator oh, sorry Pratt. Senator Pratt the um, attachment point for the um, leave and for the benefits is um, indicated by your wages so there's a, a wage attachment point where you have to earn enough in that quarter in order to be eligible for the the benefits Mr. so you can't work for a week and then take 12 weeks mm -hmm. off mr. chair could the author point me to that section in the bill representative Halverson let me I can find it for you and we'll get back to you if you want to keep asking questions I'll get to that section of the bill well of course I want to be you know I don't want to hold up this hearing um, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm really not trying to hold up this area. I'm well, trying to ask. I, I think I'm because asking. Because I think this is going to be your last question because then I'm going to go up and do the wage theft. Well, We've Mr. seen how Mr. Uh, Representative Lesh can't seem to get a text message. Uh, well, Mr. Chair, I have a lot more to, to cover besides. I'm sure this. Representative Halverson would, and the commission would love to sit with you and go over ed, each and every one of those questions. Uh, Mr. Chair, as, as was discussed during uh, my opening concerns, this is supposed to be a hearing that vets out these provisions and while we should be talking about the differences between the bills as representative long said and I'm, I'm very interested in making sure representative long gets a thorough understanding of this bill uh, as he indicated he wanted to have and I think these are all valid questions they are not uh, uh, they are all to the bill and I and, 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 and Senator Pratt I actually think you're starting to just pester the witness and prolong and, and log roll the particular hearing that's not appreciated any more than the, um, the conversation that you have requested. So I, as the chair, I'm telling you, you have one more question, and then we'll go to the wage and uh, the, the uh, wage step bill. Uh, go for it. Well, Mr. Well, Mr. Chair, uh, I guess in anticipation of that, um, I will ask try to ask a. A fairly comprehensive question, along with uh, some additional handouts. Uh, if, if I could get a page to uh, uh, to help me, uh, Representative Halverson, Commissioner Grove, um, I'm going to ask a, a fairly broad question. So, as an insurance program is defined in statute, uh, there are certain uh, rules around how that uh, is managed. Um, I have not found anywhere in the statute where it talks about uh, any sort of reserve, minimum mandated reserve that needs to be uh, held. The, uh, as far as I can tell, and I don't understand the formula, and I would like, so I would like to understand what's the minimum uh, reserve that's being held, how are the premiums being calculated, uh, because the bill doesn't require an actuarial study, it's, it's a formula that uh, doesn't seem to be uh, uh, necessarily based on studies. Uh, the opt-out, the fiscal note uh, presumes that there will be no opt-outs, and you've already testified that uh, we're going to have employers uh, <clears throat> opting out. For those employers that opt out, would they be able to, uh, uh, and, and you say as long as they have a, a benefit that exceeds, uh, I guess my question, you know, as part of this uh, one question in 27 parts, uh, would be... Um, uh, does that benefit have to be progressive in order to meet the statute that you've laid out? Um, the concern being that the, what I'm handing out is from the Chicago Tribune that says um, 
uh, but parental leave initiatives threaten to worsen and widen the disparities in children's health and early learning, along with the chasms of race and class. Uh, the inequity reveals the hazards facing well-meaning Democrats as they uh, promise unbridled entitlements. Uh, Representative Halverson, do you understand the question at this particular point? I do. Please answer it. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm Mr. not done asking my question. Uh, yes, you are. Oh, Mr. Chair, this is uh, uh, Representative Halverson, would you proceed with the answer to the question? Mr. Chair and Senator, um, I, I think that it might be a, a really good idea for us to, um, you know, continue to meet and have conversations um, uh, because you didn't get to hear the bill um, in, in your chamber and, and kind of see how it's changed. Um, I think that a commentary from uh, the Chicago Tribune is, is just that it's a commentary. And if you wanted to um, uh, go through some studies, I have uh, numerous uh, stacks of studies, including um, studies that were testified to by our own Commissioner of Health on the savings in the healthcare system that we see in other states, the increase in workforce participation among women with young children in other states. And so um, these are programs that work, and they work around the world, and they work for um, private employers very, very well. Um, the, we are here with a bill, and I'm happy to work to continue to improve um, the bill because um, the end goal is vitally important to the economic security of Minnesotans. Thank you, Representative Mr. Halverson. Thank you for your comments. Uh, Representative Lesh, would you like to come down for your in, uh, earned sick and safe time? Mr. Mr. Chair. Uh, I haven't recognized you. I understand. Mr. Chair, I'd like to be recognized. Representative Lesh, yes. would you like to speak to the earned sick and safe time? I would. I would, Mr. Chair. Thank you for inviting me down Mr. on my Chair, casual day. Mr. Chair, uh, this is, uh, again, disrespectful to the, uh, uh, to the Senate and to the committee, and the idea was to, the uh, idea of this uh, hearing was to get a vetting of the bills. We're not getting, uh, I, as the lone Senate uh, representative, have not had a chance to ask my questions and fully vet the bill. Uh, we haven't had a chance to review the fiscal note, which would certainly be under the, the purview of this committee. Uh, the, while I understand the chair has a, uh, uh, an agenda that he wants to get through, I am uh, offended uh, by the uh, insinuation that we're just trying to log roll this. I think I raised some very valid points at the beginning of the meeting under our, our joint rules of Masons that this, is, that this entire committee has been you know, set I've up. I've been very lenient now, here. I have not recognized you. Representative Lesh, would you like to carry on with your bill? Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Article 6 and 7 of the bill are earned sick and safe time. Uh, I've been carrying this bill in various forms since 2007 because everyone in Minnesota gets sick. Uh, and when I first started carrying it, 41% uh, of Minnesotans didn't have access to any sick or safe leave. Uh, but since Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Duluth passed some version, we're down to 36%, which is good. But that's still 932,000 Minnesotans who don't have access to this. So we're the state with the second highest number of Fortune 500 companies per capita. Um, but there's still mothers and fathers that need to make a tough decision between caring for themselves and, and loved ones or losing wages or even losing their jobs because it's still... It's still legal to fire someone uh, who can't show up because they're sick. So the proposal benefits employers through improved recruitment and retention, lower, uh, lower health care costs, but also the costs associated with presenteeism. Um, employers who talk about workers coming to work and coughing on their coworkers and, and bringing down production due to that, which, which still happens. Um, so this is a, a public health issue because the Minnesota Department of Health in 2015 um, had a paper that talked about um, many of the employees who are least likely to have paid sick time were those people who, who cough on your food um, or take care of your kids. Um, so those are the people we want probably most to have them, and they're the least like one, likely ones to have them. So we hope that, that you'll really consider this, because regardless of where you live, the color of your skin, or um, the things you're going through with your kids, um, you're going to want to help take care of them. And this proposal will help balance out the burden um, that occurs between employers and employees now, um, that only some people are in a position uh, to bear, bear that weight. Um, and if the entire state is in a position to bear that weight with just one hour for every 30 hours work, it's minimal. There's the cap on how much you can carry over. And I, I would close with this, Mr. Chair. When I first started carrying this in 2007, there was only one jurisdiction that had this. 
uh, and that was San Francisco, California, as uh, I'm sure you know, like Republicans don't like San Francisco, but I don't even like San Francisco that much actually either. But um, they were the only one. Uh, and now we have six or seven states um, and about three dozen more cities that have it. And if you go talk to the chambers of commerce in those cities and in those states, they, may be, they, may, they say like, well, yeah, we'd be grudging acceded to it, but is it a big problem now? No, no, it's, it's, it's not. People agree to it. It's, the cost is extremely minimal. Um, so we hope you'll consider it. That's all, that's all I got, Mr. Chair. Did you uh, have a sure. yes, thank you. testifier thank you. that would like to identify herself for the tape and proceed with anything that you have to say? All right. Hi, um, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Ray, and I'm here to testify on Earn Sick and Save Time. Um, again, my name is Ray, and I'm a social studies education student at St. Cloud State University. I'm the oldest of five children, part of the LGBTQ community, and half Mexican. My mother is a medical receptionist, retail manager, and works the front desk of a hotel. My father is a military vet and is going back to school while also working as a maintenance and security person at the local hospital. I'm here today to tell you about my, my story of what, about why earned sick and save time is necessary for my life. My youngest brother has asthma, and when he was little, he would often have to stay home when it was too cold or when his allergies were acting up. Being 11 years older than him, I often had to stay home with him because neither of my parents had sick time. The first time I remember staying home from school to take care of him was when I was 12 years old. I remember missing a lot of school during my middle school and high school years, and during my junior and senior year, I was taking college-level courses, um, and I was getting berated by my teachers for missing school. Because of this, I carry a lot of animosity towards the systems of employment and poverty my parents were trapped in. I realize that I can't be mad at my parents for missing part of my education because they were just trying their best. They should not have had to make the choice to pull kids out of school because they couldn't miss a paycheck. My parents did the best they could, but they were left with a hard choice like many parents because we do not have the systems in place to support parents and children. I now work two jobs, one in child care and one in retail. I don't have sick time in either, and I have had to make really difficult choices if I can miss a day of pay um, to take time to take care of myself when I'm sick. If you think working with little kids is hard, try doing it when you lost your voice and are fatigued. In both of my jobs, I work with people, and I'm worried one day I can get someone else sick because I couldn't lose pay by calling in. Not having paid sick time has put me in tough situations since I was a child and it still is to this day. I'm going to school right now to become a teacher and be the first person on my dad's side of the family to earn a bachelor's degree. I work two jobs to make ends meet, one in childcare, one in retail. I don't have sick time in either of those jobs. While I wanna be a teacher, I don't believe I should have to find a better job to earn the ability to take care of myself and loved ones when I'm sick. I'm a human now and I'll be a human then. I deserve to be able to take care of myself Please support Earn Sick and Save Time. Support workers, children, parents, students, and all Minnesotans who have to decide between staying home to take care of themselves or paying a bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, if there's five minutes worth of questions, that's just fine. We're going to try and get to the jobs, uh, the wage and wage stuff bill. Um, please proceed, Senator Pr uh, Pratt. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, and. Uh, you know, and, and thank you, you had a, a very compelling story and I appreciate that. Uh, but Mr. Chair, um, I, I raised at the beginning the concerns of this committee uh, and, and how it was being run. Uh, you set the agenda. Uh, you're not allowing uh, the Senate to, to and, and, and the rest of the committee members to get a, a good and thorough vetting of the bills. There was nothing in the agenda that stated that there were gonna be set amount of time or limit on questions. Uh, it just goes to show that this is uh, nothing but uh, political theater. So, Mr. Chair, uh, I am going to ask our nonpartisan staff to go back and start working uh, to finish up on the uh, bill comparisons so that we can get back to the work of the people of Minnesota and hopefully, Representative Wigenius, that you and I and Chair Mahoney can meet uh, after you're done with this, uh, uh, with this uh, hearing and uh, we can talk about governance and set this up so that we don't go through this uh, circus again. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm, I guess I'm done wasting my time. If you're not gonna allow me to ask the questions and to thoroughly vet these bills, then uh, uh, it's a waste of my time. 
uh, and it's a waste of the, uh, the time of the people of Minnesota. And so Senator, that, Senator Pratt, the, cha the chair's duty is to protect the witnesses from pestering and uh, setting down the plow. So if you choose to leave this committee and not hear about these particular issues, that certainly sends a message to the people of Minnesota. Well, so enjoy yourself. Well, Mr. Chair, if we're not going to be able to ask questions, and, and well, I think I think, I think sorry, Mr. Senator Senator Pratt, I think I gave you over a half an hour's worth of time to ask questions, and then when I said please clear it up, please clean, uh, finish it up, you came up with a question that had 27 parts. You know, we may be the uh, the lower body, as you like to call us, but we're not stupid. So why don't you just leave Thank and you. play your game? Well, Mr. Are, there any, are there any questions for Representative uh, Lesh or his testifier? Representative Malone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Lesh would be, you mentioned uh, that sneezing in food is one of the um, primary public health risks of folks not being able to uh, take paid uh, sick time and or earn sick time. And I'm curious if we have any data or um, information about that issue statewide and how, how that's impacting our state's health and, and uh, our uh, ability to have uh, productive workers. Oh, um, so, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, to proceed, West. thank you, to proceed that question, um, I don't think this is political theater. If I did, I probably would have dressed up a little nicer if I thought it was theater. <laughs> But I forgot that I had this today. Um, and I know the senators like to dress up a little bit more, too. Um, so I feel bad about that. But um, on, on the public health issue of that, um, the, there is a much higher percentage, yes, both in Minnesota um, and in other states that do not have guaranteed earn, earn sick and safe leave, um, that the people uh, who do not have access to this benefit as a matter of law are the food service workers, the child care workers, other low wage workers, but especially those folks who are handling your food um, and working with children. Uh, I have a two year old and I've gotten sick five times more often uh, this winter uh, than I did in previous winters because she's getting sick from other kids. So um, I don't have the statistics for you right here, but yes, it is a much higher percentage. Um, Representative Lesh, you know, I have a, um, a new grandson that's about a year and a half old, and I've been sick more in the last year and a half than I can ever imagine. And I've, unfortunately, our members from the Jobs Committee can, t can testify to the fact that I spent a week and a half coughing up a lung, um, sitting poorly, poorly sitting next to my legislative, my committee assistant and a number of others. So. But I don't know if, I don't think I need sick and safe time because I'm uh, a salaried employee here. Does your, does your uh, bill cover salary? How does it treat salaried employees? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, it, uh, as long as there is a benefit uh, with those salaried employees, um, then uh, it, you're covered if there is a sick time benefit. If you are a salaried employee and there is nothing in your current um, either contract uh, or employment um, arrangement with HR that gives you a sick and safe leave, then you accrue the one hour for every 30 hours that you're worked. And that's presumptive based on the fact that it's a 40 hour work week. Um, I would also add to uh, Representative Long's previous question, there is a statistic that I recall, um, but this was 12 years ago when I first started walking, uh, working on this. The, the national, uh, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, cost for presenteeism of folks showing up and getting other sick was $16 billion a year uh, in 2007. Um, lost work productivity due to presenteeism, people refusing to leave work because they were sick and getting everyone else sick. Well, thank you, unless there's any other questions. Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. We hope to be able to move this forward in the conference committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before we go to wage theft, I wanted to, um, um, I had to ask somebody to go take a look at Mason's, and um, the last sentence in Ma Mason 771, it is usual for the chair of the conference committee of the House of Origin
to take the principal responsibility for arranging, arranging of the conference. A literal meeting, reading might suggest, under this sentence, would always take the principal responsibility. So uh, we could go on with that, but um, I wish Senator Pratt was here so we could continue the discussion about uh, Masons. But with that, um, Representative Virginia. I'm going to go right up there. Representative Mahoney. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, House File, yeah, I think it's House File 6. I've been calling it 2208 for so long. Um, I'll quickly explain the bill. Uh, it has 22 or 23 sections. Um, the, uh, well, before I even go there. I want to say that I've carried this bill last year and this year, um, and I have met with person after person, uh, round tables, group discussions, and when I started carrying this bill, I thought wage theft was $100 here or a couple hundred dollars there, you know, somebody not getting their overtime, such as has happened to me. Um, the sad piece for me, and the piece that has given me a reason to really push this bill, is that I've been hearing from people who have lost thousands of dollars to wage theft. There's a section in this bill that talks about the enhanced penalty having theft at $35,000. I think they'll reach that. I really think that there are out there employers using this as a business model that steal thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands from their employees. And this is not, this is not the, the vast majority of, uh, of businesses in the state of Minnesota. I think most business people get up in the morning thinking, how am I gonna make sure payroll is made? Because these folks have put a trust and a, and a honesty into me. So what this bill does is goes after those people who use a business model to steal from working people. That's where I'm at with this. And this bill, and, and I, again, I'm just gonna quickly go through the, the highlights of it. Section one talks about uh, wage theft being uh, used in the responsible contractor law. Section two, gives the authority for the Department of Labor and Industry to investigate and enter a place of business to investigate. Um, section three, uh, the commissioner may require the submission of records and creates a fine. Section four, the commissioner may issue subpoenas for testifying production of documents and the orders to carry them out. Section five gives the uh, commissioner the power to obtain a court order I was shocked to hear that a business would shut their door on their investigators. I've, I've worked construction and OSHA has come onto the job and you do not prevent OSHA from coming onto the job. And to hear that, they, that these particular men and women, these inspectors could be shut out of a business trying to do their job is appalling to me. Section six, this gives the authority to the commissioner to uh, investigate uh, an, an entity and share, I'm sorry, to share with um, uh, that an investigation is happening with the entity that license or regulates. Section seven is pretty much the same above, only it talks about local government and state agencies. Section eight, um, uh, the uh, commissioner is allowed or to require the employer to inform all employees at that place of business that there is an investigation going on, henceforth, if someone has been um, reluctant to come forward, they might have the ability or the, the courage to come forward at that point. Section nine uh, requires 
uh, employers to keep new employee records, not too many, maybe a line or two on their form, and make them available to the inspectors. Section 10 creates a misdemeanor for wage theft and retaliation. Section 11 is joint enforcement, allows for joint enforcement with the Attorney General. Section 12 expands prohibited practices regarding wage payments. In other, other words, um, it expands the piece that if, you're, if the employer says, I want you to tell everybody I'm paying you $10 an hour and they're really only paying eight, you can, uh, it expands that particular um, uh, prohibitation. Uh, section 13 allows for uh, other types of enforcements um, uh, allowed by law. So not only can the uh, Department, Department of Labor and Industry deal with it, but any other uh, law that is able to enforce wage theft is also allowable. Commission, and, uh, section 14, the commissioner may issue citations to the employer uh, that have failed to pay wages and fines up to $1,000. Uh, I really like the citation piece to it because it makes it more like a parking ticket or a um, such as that so it can be dealt with relatively quickly. These um, men and women who have money stolen from them need that money quickly to pay for food, to pay for transportation, to pay for rent. And it is not appropriate to have to wait sometimes six months, nine months, a year and to, with today's rules and laws uh, it doesn't help them. They're out of their house, they're homeless, you can't find them anymore. Uh, section 15 allows for administrative review. Section 16 provides, uh, sec uh, section 181.03 does not limit the, does not limit federal or other state laws. Um, 17, section 17 um, is, deals with retaliation and creates a rebuttable presumption of retaliation. If it, recur, if it occurs within 90 days. So if, um, if I call, call out my employer and all of a sudden my, my hours reduce by half, that's a retaliation. If I'm fired within 90 days, that's a retaliation. Um, section 18 um, adds information on the employee's pay, uh, pay stub based on pay and allowance. So, the basis on pay, allowances for uniforms or meals or lodging, and it requires a phone number and address of the employer be, and be put in writ, writing and given to the employee. Uh, section 19 uh, talks about how often an employee is paid. Section 20 gives the authority to the AG. Section 21 amends the definition of value to determine severity of wage theft. Section 22 um, um, hmm, adds intentional authorization of or engaging in wage theft to the list of uh, acts that constitute theft in the criminal statute. Section 23 is where we, um, under 609.52, uh, where we're really saying if you steal $35,000 from somebody or a group of people, uh, you are subject to the enhanced penalty and you may be sentenced to prison for up to 20 years and fined $100,000. That will get those people out of business. And Section 24 is the appropriation and it's uh, roughly about, uh, about $2 million a year. And we can go over that further as we get... Um, more into uh, conference committee at the exact dollar that it will be. I'm sure my witness here will say that it it needs to be for a 2.2 some odd change a year, but we have a budget to do. <laughs> and Madam Chair, I'd like to introduce my uh, my witness, Commissioner of the Department of Labor and Industry, Nancy Leppett. Welcome, Chair, members of the committee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify um, before you this afternoon. Um, I think that the context that we are in is where when the Fair Labor Standards Act in Minnesota was originally enacted, we were looking at the obligations to set minimum standards for paying the minimum wage, uh, for paying overtime, um, and then under Chapter 181, 
as, as the issues related to the payment of wages be, uh, grew, then the laws related to ensuring that workers were paid the wages they were owed was expanded. These are the substantive provisions. But where we're at now, and, and the issues regarding wage theft that have become more rampant to now we're starting about not just responding or ensuring the compliance, but we're talking about combating wage theft, is the fact that, um, the, that in many sectors, whether it's the janitorial sector, whether it's the, um, uh, um, whether it's the construction sector, the hospitality sector, um, whether it's the home care sector, that in, in many of these sectors, that it's become systemic. The failure to pay wages in these highly labor-intensive environments, that the way you compete and are often there in, in situations where there's tiers of some contracting, so you, know, you outsource a, your maintenance and your janitorial services. So then all the companies that are trying to compete for that contract, the only place that they really can compete is on how much are they going to pay their workers. So as the whole dynamic of business has changed, has there been an increase in outsourcing of, of key parts of your business, and then that, and these are often labor intensive parts of your business, then the, then the issue of wage theft has grown. And so consequently, we've moved from sort of setting basic standards and making sure that employers understood the need to pay the minimum wage or to pay overtime. We've now moved into have the challenge of having to combat business practices that are truly undercutting the good businesses who are trying to comply with the law, who are creating decent jobs for their workers to ensure that they have a level playing field upon which to compete. And I think over the last couple months where we've had testimony from multiple businesses, but also from workers, that they can't compete in this environment. And therefore, there's a critical need to improve the enforcement tools that the department has. There's a critical need to, have, um, to better define and clarify and enhance the potential consequences for violating the law. And there's also a need uh, for um, there to be opportunity to make sure that it, the Attorney General's office has a role to play, but also that we ensure that licensing entities and government contracting entities are also uh, playing their role in addressing these issues. So consequently, the bill that um, is before you is truly in response to uh, a need for this stronger enforcement, meaning that we um, need the ability to go into a workplace where the door has been slammed in an investigator's face or where they have been threatened to the point where they need to back out and bring in a warrant and potentially a sheriff to be able to deal with the, the situation. And this is particularly true in the context where labor trafficking may be going on. So consequently, these are not sort of nice to haves, these are need to haves authority in order for the Department of Labor and Industry to be able to do its job. But you should note that even with both the subpoena authority and the inspection order authority, these are all uh, matters that would need to be uh, reviewed by a judge, the district court, in order to ensure that the action that the department wants to take is appropriate. So this is not my, I will not be able to get an order to demand to go into a workplace. I will need to go before a district court to say that there's a reason to need this order and therefore the, the district court will review that request and ensure that I'm exercising my authority appropriately. And that's true for both the subpoena authority and for the administrative order support authority. Also, it's important that when the investigative authority of the department was first enacted. This again was back in a time where we were reviewing payroll records and every worker on a work, in a workplace was an employee. Now that's not so true. We have a lot of situations where workers are not even identified on the payroll, are being paid under the table, who are told to run and hide when the inspector shows up. So consequently, we need to make sure that our investigative authority and what we're allowed to investigate is consistent with the investigative challenges that we will face in workplaces. Again, the idea is, is that it's a waste of my agency's time to inspect a, a workplace that's in compliance. This authority is tailored to 
make sure that when I have a workplace that's not in compliance, that we have the capacity to, to effectively enforce the law. Then when we look at the payroll obligation to increase the amount of data that's in payroll records, well, I don't know a business out there who wouldn't want to know what the address of the contractor that they're about to contract with, what their address is, or what their telephone number is, or to know what the rate of pay that they're going to receive as part of that contract. So consequently, the requirements here are just basic elements of a contract that um, are going to make it one uh, more readily for workers and employers to resolve their own issues. But of course, that the Department of Labor and Industry needs to be engaged that we can more readily determine whether or not the terms of that employment agreement have been complied with. And the need for the employers to keep those records and also to provide the agency with those records when we're in inspection, of course, is critical for us to effectively and efficiently um, do our duty. And then, of course, the, the need for some increases in penalties. Um, there are many instances where we need that authority to create the incentive for employers to actually do what the law requires them to do. And as Representative Mahoney has indicated, the citation authority is, is very important because, as he's indicated, in workers who are being paid the minimum wage, they don't have the opportunity to wait a week, two weeks, a month for, to receive the wages that they are owed. So this is a mechanism by which the department can um, more readily obtain um, the attention of the employer and to get the agreement of the employer to pay the wages that they're owed. So consequently, all of this is a matter of really taking on the challenges that we are confronted with today and making sure that we have the toolbox uh, necessary to respond to that challenge. Thank you. I have some questions. Uh, Representative Long. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. A question for Chair Mahoney. Curious how in, in current law the treatment of wage theft differs from our, our treatment of other property theft crimes. You know, you have a bit of an advantage. Madam Chair, Representative Long, you have a bit of an advantage as an attorney. Um, and I am not. So I have to use non-attorney language. But I will <laughs> preface it with this. Um, and, and good, good for uh, the previous commissioner, Commissioner, commissioner Peterson, deciding to make this uh, something that they should look at. Uh, prior to that effort, uh, the system was broken. The system was totally broken and uh, almost non-existent. And uh, Commissioner Peterson decided to make a, a, a push and they increased, I can't remember the exact number, but it was told to me, uh, but they helped 39,000 people get money. And I think the total out to $12 million um, uh, in, in the first year that they made that that hard push on it. So I would say, and, and I want to thank um, Commissioner Leppett. She has made this a, uh, it's almost a passion. So I'm, I don't know what to call it that, you know, I'll call it that. Um, we are going to help a ton of people, a ton of people, and we are going to drive these folks out of business, the ones that use this as a business model to harm not only workers, but honest businesses. And, um, you know, I spent 20 years trying to help businesses start up and stay in business in the state of Minnesota. Uh, and to lose one even hurts a bit. Uh, if we can keep an honest business person, businessman or businesswoman in business with this law, I think it's a, uh, it, it, it will be well taken. But the simple answer is I think it was broken. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chair Mahoney, uh, we know that many undocumented uh, immigrants are used by our labor industry, um, and they're not given a fair wage. Sometimes they're not, they work many, many hours, and they're told, I'm going to call ICE or I'm going to call immigration authorities. Would you say this bill goes as far as protecting those um, undocumented immigrants and the false uh, the 
theft in labor that's happening everywhere in our state. Representative Mahoney. I, I, thank you. Um, and I, I'm going to ask the commissioner to also answer this particular question. Do I think it goes far enough? Um, I think it does a good job, but it will only do as good a job as the inspectors and the translators that are hired by the department. Because uh, certainly if somebody walks, if I was the inspector and I walked up to someone who was here um, illegally, I don't believe that I would be automatically granted the trust. And that's really part of when an inspector comes in, they have to be able to develop the trust with the person that they're trying to help. So I'll, with that, I'll turn it over to the commissioner. So, Chair, Representative. Um, so Representative Mahoney is correct that if the department receives the money that the governor has proposed in his budget of $3.5 million, the, one of the focuses of that will be to hire investigators that come from uh, diverse backgrounds and have a language capacity to be able to communicate with both employers and workers in the state of Minnesota. And that he's absolutely correct. In order to develop, in order to conduct an effective investigation, you have to be able to communicate. Uh, you have to be able to take, uh, to conduct interviews. And that means you have to be able to communicate with workers. And to do that effective mean, means you have to have the language capacity um, to be able to do to con to do that engagement. When I left the Wage and Hour Division for the U.S. Department of Labor, 60% of my investigators were bilingual or multilingual, and therefore, in any circumstance, we could uh, bring in investigators who were capable of communicating with both the workers and employers. And I would like to see a similar capacity in the state of Minnesota. So, your question regarding um, uh, undocumented workers, Department of Labor and Industry does not ask workers what their status is. If you are employed or you are working and you are owed wages, it is our responsibility to ensure you are paid those the wages you are owed. Uh, Madam Chair and um, Chair Mahoney and Commissioner, so would you say that, let's just say that if the Department of Labor find out that there is an entity or a company that's engaging in those activities that there is as far as going fine for them to pay or citation um, I know that many undocumented workers would not come up and tell people that I'm undocumented worker I haven't been paid because of you know fear of immigration or deportation but if the Department of Labor finds out that there is a company out there that's engaging those uh, wage theft, would you say that it goes as far as citation or giving them a fine or is the reinforcement in this bill go that far or not? Um, Madam Chair, um, Representative, Department of Labor and Industry would enforce the law that it's responsible for enforcing. So the Department of Labor and Industry is not responsible for, for enforcing the federal immigration laws. So we would not be enforcing those laws. We are responsible for enforcing the state's minimum wage and overtime laws and other wage laws, prevailing wage laws, et cetera. And therefore, when we go into a workplace, we are looking to determine whether or not those laws have been complied with. And if we find they have not been, we will pursue the appropriate um, remedy for the workers and if, if indicated um, the appropriate penalties for the employer. But it will be based on a determination of whether or not there's been compliance uh, or non-compliance with the laws of the state. Other questions from members? I don't see other questions, Representative Mahoney. Uh, is there something else you'd like to say to us? Um, thank you, committee members. Um, uh, and to the uh, witnesses here in the audience, um, thank you, Representative uh, Commissioner. Uh, I want to apologize for the um, uh, the antics that were put forth by my colleagues from the other chamber. Uh, hopefully, we can on Monday start off on a better foot, um, and we certainly will be in contact with the Senate. 
uh, with that, I have nothing further on this particular day. So uh, when you're ready, you can adjourn. Well, just to announce to the public, uh, it, in the normal course now, under our rules. I would tell you to talk into the microphone if you're going to announce to the public. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Got it. Okay, under our normal rules, uh, 2.06, uh, we rotate uh, the chair, and the, uh, so Saturday would be uh, the Senate, and Monday would be the House again. Uh, we haven't heard a posting yet for the Senate on Saturday or Sunday, uh, but if that happens, we will be in touch with everyone, and we will certainly be here to do uh, work that Minnesotans need us to do. Uh, on, but I can tell you about Monday because uh, I am uh, posted as chair for that day. And under custom and usage, uh, it is the chair that sets the agenda. So I'll just tell you about the agenda uh, coming up for Monday. Um, we will be here. We'll start uh, at 12.30 and we will start promptly. We, we're later in the day because it's a Monday and allowing people to come into town on Monday. Uh, but we'll start promptly at 12.30. We will have uh, testimony about the impacts of climate change on Minnesota and what business is doing in Minnesota to respond to that. So we'll hear from some businesses in Minnesota. Uh, we will take a break. I expect that to take maybe up to something over an hour. Uh, we will take a recess so folks can have a lunch. And we'll come back and go through the side-by-sides. And we'll go until 6. We will take a, another break for supper. And we will come back. And I expect us to be able to go through uh, policy and start adopting uh, policy. Uh, in the, we should be able to do some in the afternoon and certainly in the evening. So if members have questions about the agenda, I'd be glad to take them. Other than that, um, we have no further business, and we can adjourn the meeting. <laughs>